Silicon Valley is its own tiny little bubble. I found myself in worse and worse mental health. The body is communicating what is right for us and what is not right for us. In some chapters in our life, maybe the identity really matters. And then in other chapters, maybe it matters less so. Welcome everyone to our Tech Minds Unwind series. My name is Siddhi Rawal and I work in tech in the Silicon Valley. In this episode, we, we are joined by Andy Johns. Andy has worked in growth product and executive roles at Facebook, Twitter, Quora, and even at Wealthfront. He's currently a startup advisor, a mentor, and now he's writing and building in the mental health space. So, hey Andy, it's, I'm so glad to have you here on this episode. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for having me. Yeah, let, let's just jump into your background and like all the work that you've done so far. Yeah, I, I, uh, I guess the short story is that uh, I worked in tech for 16, 17 years in various startup positions. I was fortunate to be a part of a handful of companies that did well. Um, I also spent about three years as the founding partner of the consumer side of an early stage venture capital firm. Uh, and spent a few years on the investing side as well. Um, but along the way, uh, just so, to connect the dots to the, the mental health side is, although I was building this, this career and I was uh, very happy about it and it's provided me a lot of opportunities in life, um, I was also struggling with my mental health along the way uh, for, for two reasons. One was, uh, I think, just the, the accumulation of stress of, uh, for anyone that works in the startup world, you know what it's like, you know, I don't need to go into detail about it. It's, it's very, very challenging and it puts a lot of, uh, a lot of stress on, on the individuals who participate in it and having spent, you know, that many years constantly grinding it, it accumulated in the form of just sort of persistent, uh, low energy, uh, on and off depression, anxiety, sometimes panic attacks, uh, you know, just seeking out, uh, things to numb myself just to be able to sleep. Um, you know, all, I think all the, uh, classic characteristics of burnout. Um, but the other factor was that as I began to seek therapy and try to work on understanding myself and improving the, uh, the quality of my, my mental and my spiritual health, uh, that's when I also came to better understand the role of early childhood experiences on what I was an what I was experiencing as an adult. You know, the the short story is that my mom passed away when I was ten. Um, she struggled with pretty severe mental illness throughout most of my childhood, and so she was in and out of psychiatric hospitals and uh, had had been dealing with really really significant mental illness and. Having been around that, uh, it had a major influence on me, and uh, and certainly when she passed away, you know that was one of several more significant traumatic events that I had had been exposed to when I was little. And so, uh, yeah, just along the way, as as my career was growing, I found myself in worse and worse uh, mental health, and it was something that I I needed to to really dig into and is something that I'm now spending a lot of time on both personally and professionally. Okay. Th thanks for sharing that authentic story of yours. So did you realize that when you joined and got into tech that there were traumas and things already when you were entering the industry and then while doing it, the startups as well? No, it was, uh, I didn't have the awareness. Uh, I, it, in retrospect, now that I do have the awareness and I've, I've traced back sort of the sequence of events and how things have unfolded for me personally over the last couple of decades, I realized that the signs were always there. The signs of trauma were always there. Um, but that I had found ways to uh, basically just bury it, just push it down or to avoid it and distract myself from it, both healthy and unhealthy. And the, the primary adaptation uh, that I developed was basically an addiction to achievement where, because there was a period in my life when I was young, where I was very, very sad, 
I turned towards achievement because whenever I won a trophy or took first place in a race or got straight A's, I was sort of showered with affection. Uh, not only with just my family, but you know, by society, we get rewarded for, for excellence. And you know, the, the brain is fundamentally an autobiographical engine. And so, uh, it, it forms these adaptations based on what has happened to it, <laughs> right? It learns, uh, it learns and adapts. And then in an attempt to predict the future based on what's happened in the past, you, you often try and recreate experiences that made you feel good and you try and avoid experiences that made you feel bad. So for me, I just, thankfully, I fell into this, this mindset of, just achieve and be excellent and perfect at everything that I do. And the good news is, is that for a long time, for 15, 20 years, that, that brought me out of a childhood depression and the emotional pain I was feeling with the loss of my mom. Um, and it gave me a really great childhood from there on out. I enjoyed high school, I enjoyed college, I enjoyed my 20s and began to build a successful career. And so that that adaptation to seek achievement and everything I did, it served me really well at one point in my life, but I later came to realize that these adaptations, if, if unnoticed and left unchecked can become maladaptive. And that's what mm -hmm. happened where I was basically just living a very imbalanced life. And my entire sense of self-worth was conditional on whether or not I was achieving and succeeding and receiving praise from others. Um, yeah. and, and that led me to overwork, to burnout, to, like I mentioned, sort of, uh, over attaching my sense of value, my personal sense of self-worth to whether or not I was doing extremely well in life. And, uh, that got to a point to where it was so extreme that I was miserable, even though I had earned everything that I sought for earlier in life and had obtained these, these lofty goals that I had, I was miserable. Uh, my physical health was failing, psychological and spiritual health was failing. And so I eventually said, you know, I've got to do the right thing for myself for the first time in my life and take care of myself from the perspective of loving myself, even if I'm not achieving. And got it. Uh, that's when I, I stepped away from the venture capital firm and from, you know, full-time executive positions. And I've spent the last couple of years focusing on rebuilding my sense of self, recovering from all of the exhaustion and overwork, continuing to heal from the old emotional wounds and mm -hmm. kind of reinventing myself. Yeah, that's great. So would you say success was your escape in those 15, 20 years? Oh yeah. It was more than an escape. It was a drug. I was very mm -hmm. addicted. Yeah. You know, having been okay. through that experience. And at one point I actually checked myself into uh, a rehab center because I was also starting to deal with earlier stages of some substance abuse. And, oh, and okay. I, had, I had these moments of awareness where I said, okay, this is heading in a bad direction and I want to get ahead of this before it gets too bad. So if you don't mind me asking, what was the tipping point? Like you knew things were building and then at the tipping point, you were like, I need to take this downhill and take care of myself. There were a couple moments. Mm. Um, you know, one was I was, I was at Wealthfront. I was one of the early employees and then five years into it. Next thing I know, I'm president of the company. Um, mm -hmm. I was next in line to become the CEO and, um, you know, try and take it public or, or, uh, a large exit of some sort. And I almost yeah. had a heart attack. Uh, so I, I okay. had to spend, so I, I had to spend two months of medical leave, just investigating what was going on with my heart because I had a sudden visit to the emergency room at Stanford. And, and that was one wake up call, which. Uh, I, I noticed at the time, of course, because it was a real risk to my cardiovascular health and to my life. Um, and so mm -hmm. I, I, I took a step away, but as a demonstration of just how attached I was to 
work and achievement and trying to make money was seven, eight months later, I said, well, you know, I'll join as one of the founding partners of this venture capital firm because, you know, that'll be, that'll be more laid back than <laughs> running the startup, you know, just, it, which it's not, it's a, it's a very hard job in its own different ways. It requires just as much effort, but, uh, you know, the, the justifications that my mind could come up with to convince me to keep going, uh, were never ending. So, uh, you know, that was one wake up call, which I swept under the carpet. And then a few years later, it was, you know, every single day I would wake up and I would just cry. And it was the first thing I would do in the morning is I, I had actually gotten into a really good meditation routine because I was just trying to keep myself going. And I would wake up, I would sit up in my bed, get into the lotus position, and then I would just weep. And that went on for weeks. And in the midst of one of those meditations, having been consistent enough with it, and I was about an hour into it where I noticed that at, at an hour is when my mind would really get quiet. And then sort of subconscious awareness or insights would sometimes very, very quickly come to the surface. And then that's when I had an epiphany moment in the depth of one of those meditations. Okay. So would you say meditation was like the best thing that happened to you to bring those things to the surface? It was certainly one of them. You know, there, I'll, I'll share a quick story. Last year, I, yeah. um, I spent a month in Northern Thailand and where they take in animals of all, all sorts. They have hundreds of them at this point. Uh, almost all of them are abused or abandoned or neglected and they rehabilitate them. And while I was there, I met a farmer who is also a practicing Buddhist. And we had a, a really good conversation for um, over some of the days. I, I could tell he had obtained a place of personal and spiritual peace that I was searching for. And as we spoke, I came to understand his his practice in terms of uh, his the rituals that he adhered to as part of his uh, Buddhist beliefs. And when we were talking, he said, you know, everyone in life, and he shared this as a metaphor, he said, everyone in life is searching for Bangkok. Uh, but the problem is they're following other people's paths to Bangkok. The point is that you must find your own path to Bangkok. You know, Bangkok, you know, Bangkok being a metaphor for, you know, whatever your piece is, your call it enlightenment if you want to. And the point yeah. he was trying to make is like, you have to find your own way there. And mm. in fact, if you just copy somebody else's path, you're not going to find what you're searching for at the end of it. And for me, I've found that that is true when it comes to healing emotionally and working on one's self-awareness, self-understanding and personal transformation is at the end of the day, you, you can work with therapists, you can work with different healers and shamans, and you can do tons of yoga and breath work and acupuncture. You can explore all the things. And the only thing that matters is, does it work for you? Because we're all different. The, we underestimate the heterogeneity of the human population. Statistically speaking, you know, I read a study that computed the, the an estimate saying, Basically, of all the sperm and all the eggs that are produced in, uh, in, in a person's lifetime, what's the probability that the same person is produced twice? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, is basically it's virtually zero. It's 10 to the 15th power, which is roughly a million times greater than the number of stars in the Milky Way. And there's well, 100, should... yeah, there's like 100 to 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. So it's a million times greater than that. So, oh. so, so, so the point is we're born unique, all of us, the same person has never existed twice, at least not in this dimension. <laughs> and, and, uh, we have completely unique life experiences as well. And, and so through the socialization of life, our uniqueness that we have upon birth is further accentuated through the uniqueness of our life experiences. 
And so that's why I say it, it's, you know, you can, you can try what other people are doing. You can read the studies that talk about aggregate statistics and average outcomes. And that may provide clues as to where you should look. But at the end of the day, you have to deeply pay attention to oneself and find what works for you. And you may not ever get the answers why, uh, but that's all that matters. So quick, that was a quick detour to answer your question, to be more direct on a few things. Yes, a daily meditation routine, specifically one where I would get into 45 minutes to one hour at a time. That's when the real magic started to happen. Uh, I had some real breakthroughs from that. I've had real breakthroughs from extended periods of time in nature, um, either alone or in near isolation. Um, I've had really uh, great benefits from psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, uh, which is you know a whole can of worms that's being opened right now. Um, but and I've had benefits from talk therapy and from exposure therapy and different forms of uh, Western clinical psychology. So uh, a little bit here, a little bit there, and I've just kind of along the way been trying to assemble my own toolkit. Yeah. So I think coming to that, that's a good detour. How do you tell if something is working or not? Like if someone is trying a lot of things, how can they say something is working for them at any point? Um, that's a great question. And it's very relevant in the modern era because mm -hmm. we, we tend to over intellectualize everything. We believe that all the answers come from some analytical process that's run mm -hmm. through the intellectual capabilities of the mind. So for example, you could say, well, I I've done therapy and I've really analyzed my behaviors uh, and how they've changed because of therapy. And through analysis and journaling and writing and taking rigorous notes, you may find that analytically like, oh, okay, things have changed for me for the better. And that's one way to do it. Uh, another way though, is to let your body tell you what the answer is. Right. Oh, so yeah. it, it's almost like the reason I love working with animals and spent time at that shelter is like they, they show you that the process of healing can actually be so much simpler. Like the way that something heals, uh, it doesn't require understanding neuroscience and a bunch of complex theories. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you go into an, a dog, sh a dog shelter, for example, it's common that you will find the dogs where their, their physical posture is revealing their psychological state. You know, the tail is tucked under, their ears are back, their eyes are wide open. They might be even hunched over, sort of curled mm -hmm. up in the corner. Like there, it's a physical expression of what is happening to them emotionally and psychologically. They're under stress. And, and sometimes you'll just see the animal shaking, right? That's what I mean is the body is telling them and telling us like the environment it is in right now is not, is not what's right for it. And then you bring the dog outside, you introduce it to different people. And sometimes it finds its owner, right? For some reason, it really attaches to one person and it feels very, very comfortable with that person, even though it might not have ever felt comfortable around people before. And then you see it relax. You know, you see it start, you see it, its mouth relax and start to pant with its mouth open with a little bit of a grin, right? You see its tail come up and start to wag, you see, and it's amazing how much the body is communicating what is right for us and what is not right for us. Mm -hmm. And in the modern world, especially, you know, think Silicon Valley tech, all that a bunch of intellectual people who have been conditioned to only use their mind to make decisions throughout most of their life. And so yeah. we, we, we fall out of touch with the intuition that we hold within us and within mm -hmm. like explicitly the bodily sensations that are communicating to us, whether or not something is good for us. Yeah. And 
So it could be as simple as, for example, for years, I've dealt with really bad uh, TMJ and clenching and grinding my teeth, especially at night. Me too. And, and, and it didn't always, it wasn't always that way. It actually began for me in college and has continued mm -hmm. since then. Um, um, but the clenching of the jaw, the holding of the tension in the soul, shoulders are physical expressions of mm, something's not, not right. I'm holding on to some emotional, some negative emotions, some intensity that, uh, I may get accustomed to slowly over time within the modern world. And then I fall out of touch with the fact that I'm tense, that I'm clenching my, I'm clenching my jaw when I'm sleeping. Why, why is that? And then interestingly enough, you know, th I'm about three years removed from Silicon Valley. And finally, I'm noticing that at night, I'm clenching my teeth less. It's like my body's slowly recalibrating, moving away from the, uh, the anxiety where it's like my body as a tuning fork had become so in touch with the environment I was in and the stress that it was anticipating the very next day. So, so I, I think to answer your question so, succinctly, so much of this process is actually uh, this process of healing and improving one's mental health is one turning off the intellect, stop reading the books, stop reading the theories and watching the YouTube videos and all that stuff. Don't intellectualize the problem because then you're actually avoiding it. It's a clever way for the mind to, to, to actually just find a new way of avoiding, you know, the sort of key body based insights that are there. So stop intellectualizing it. And then through a process of experimentation and exploration, you know, try whether it's yoga or it's moving to a different city and becoming, you know, digital instead and working remotely, whatever the thing is, try it and then sit and pay attention and get back in touch with the intelligence of your body. It'll tell you what the answers are. Yeah, no, I think those are great points. I think a couple of things came to mind while you you were like explaining the entire experience is that working in tech kind of cements the idea of always using your intellect, always being on your machines. So I feel like since we start studying, even in college or before, we forget how to feel our body and we've never taught to listen to our body. So I feel like the biggest things that happens with people working in tech is they just stop listening to their body. There might be so many different signs that come along the way, like anxiety, clenching your fist or like sweating a lot or getting sort of a panic attack before a meeting. But we sort of avoid all of those thinking that it's just something to do with our physical health or then we just become so unaware that we stop noticing those at all. That's right. And, you know, it's the, the sort of frog in the pot being slowly boiled analogy, right? Like, we are slowly being boiled alive without realizing that it's happening. And then yeah, the next yeah. thing you know, something acute happens, a panic attack or uh, uh, some major health issue or a major breakdown in your relationships. And then all of a sudden we're like, how did that happen? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so slowly and then suddenly. That's how it happens. Exactly. Yeah. So like... From all of your experiences, and I know that you've written on your blog that you spent over $200,000 like trying different kinds of solutions. So what would you say would be the early signs for people in tech especially, I mean, that people can notice and figure out that something is off? Um, sometimes it's just not even the signs. It's that voice that pops up in your head that's like, I don't want to do this. And then you very quickly just say, eh, and you just push it down. <laughs> like that's how many times do we do that? Like, I don't want to work for this asshole of a boss anymore. And then we hold that, you know, we hold that thought for a moment. We're like, well, but I make 160 grand a year. And then we just push it away. Um, you know, for me, it's just a question of, 
how do you want to live? As high achievers who went to good schools and then got into this interesting uh, industry that offers all sorts of financial mobility and what have you, like I'm, I'm not going to tell anyone hey, don't establish a good career and make money for yourself and establish financial security. Go do that if you want to. But do it with eyes wide open, with a real self-awareness of like, why am I doing this? And for how long am I willing to do it based on what the trade-offs are? So it, it's, you know, I fell into this, like Silicon Valley is its own tiny little bubble and you get blinders when you're in there because all you do is hear about changing the world and people making tons of money and blah, blah, blah. And then the next thing you know, that's all you care about because you're just surrounded by that, that narrative. And sometimes you just got to step away from it all and realize like, oh yeah, there's a thousand different ways I can live. This is just one way. And, and maybe... I don't need to break myself emotionally and physically and spiritually over my work in order to buy a million dollar home, because maybe that doesn't matter when it comes to having a life that is fulfilling. And, and so it, 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 it's, I'm not negative Silicon Valley. I think it does exactly what it was intended to do, which is, develop new transformative technologies and create huge amounts of new wealth. It wasn't designed for your well-being. You know, I'm not saying that as, as a judgment either. It's just, it wasn't designed for that. There are other places in the world that were designed for that. Um, and so just know, like take it for what it is and then go into it. Like I said, eyes, eyes wide open and say, okay, like I can be very successful here more often than not, that's going to place a large burden on me uh, emotionally and psychologically. It doesn't, it doesn't have to, but it often does. And how long am I willing to do that based on the way that I want to live? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's hard Man. to do. Though. It's hard to do, though, when you're surrounded by all the same messages, right? Yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, like asking the correct questions you actually put me in a lot of thought as well <laughs> sitting here so yeah i think do you have anything you want to complete there or i'll pivot into like the no. solutions and what you're doing no 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 i think yeah let, let's uh let's turn the page yeah i think we cover a ton of like things that are that are happening in tech and your background and all of that now let's try to move towards um the things that you're doing today and how you found value for yourself. And if someone who's listening is trying to figure out how they can build value for themselves and make themselves happy, what's the page they should be looking at? Yeah. So, you know, to get into the specifics of it, you know, I, 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 I quit the venture capital firm. I took a lot of time off just to rest, recover and continue to, seek professional therapy and, and try to work through the childhood trauma that I was still holding on to. But along the way, I had this thing that was nagging at me, which was that I was so conditioned to be doing something, right? Um, it, it's, it's, it's very similar to what professional athletes experience when they retire, uh, or really anybody in any profession that's can, committed themselves to one thing for so long, your sense of identity is completely attached and, and uh, wound up in it. And then unbundling that is, is difficult. And so anyhow, I, I, I went into this, this uh, period of exploration where I said, okay, I'm going to basically say yes to everything that comes my way that the universe just sort of puts in front of me. I'll just say yes. It, using, using this metaphor of like life has a river as opposed to a mountain to climb. Like in the first part of my life, it was life is a mountain. I'm going to climb the tallest mountain in the world. And then once I get up there, it's going to feel amazing. And then everything's glory thereafter. Turns out that's not true. You have to keep climbing mountains. Uh, and you can only do that for so long, right? <laughs> so instead, I, I've switched to 
I don't want to climb mountains. I want to float down rivers. <laughs> and yeah, so so thinking of life as like, what if it's not this thing to accomplish? What if instead it's possible that there is some sort of uh, one of many preordained paths for me is that is that there's a different path in life that requires me to to just surrender and let go and allow the universe to just work on my behalf and to let things unfold in my life as opposed to trying to analytically plan the future and always accomplish a goal and and so as i started to say okay let me just say yes to whatever pops up in my life surrender to the serendipity of of that and then as I experience these kind of unexpected things, like just see if any of it sticks. <laughs> and uh, one of those things that stuck was that I, I started writing, um, beginning with a simple sub stack, uh, just because I reached this point to where like, I couldn't fight this feeling that like something wanted me to express the experiences I had. And I had a bunch of entrepreneurs. I had some old high school friends. I had some family members. I had all of a sudden, I had a bunch of people that coincidentally fell into my life who were also dealing with their own mental health challenges. And things came together in a way where it just felt like, okay, yeah, writing and telling my, sp my story and using that as a way to connect with others seems to be what's coming up for me next. And so I started writing the Substack. Um, and then from there, um, more of these sort of intuitive, creative ideas popped up, um, that I've continued to work on. And so now I spend most of my, call it working time doing a variety of different, uh, you know, mental health, uh, initiatives. One of those is working with military veterans with, uh, PTSD and helping them get access to psychedelic assisted therapy through a nonprofit I'm on the board of called Heroic Hearts Project. It's a really great group. Being able to spend time helping veterans, I do my writing and have these sorts of conversations to connect with other high performers who are running into these, uh, you know, just heading towards burnout or starting to ask these big existential questions. And so that's how I spend most of my time now, not really focused on making any of it kind of a business or a big successful thing, just trying to approach it more as art than business, more of a, an act of creative expression and of personal expression uh, than an act of seeking achievement so that I feel good about myself. Uh, I can't say I've, I've figured it all out yet. It's still a work in progress. Um, but you know, three years into kind of reconditioning myself to approach things differently, that's where I'm at. Yeah, it's yeah. always a tug of war. But yeah, yeah, I think we've come full circle with that. <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to cover in the podcast? No, I, I, I guess like last message to any of the high achievers that are out there is, yes. you know, so some people ask me like, where do I even start? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if there's a part of them that has this question of, of like something doesn't feel right. Um, mm -hmm. Something's not quite right. I don't feel like I'm in the right place. You know, what do I do? Uh, my answer is like, trust your gut, whatever your gut is telling you to do next. Like maybe your gut has a deep, deep intellect and it knows what's right for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe you just got to listen to it and, and begin the process of understanding yourself. If you deeply, deeply, deeply understand yourself and you seek the truth as to why you are the way you are and who you are, you will find your mm -hmm. answer so long as you start there. So that, that would be my advice is seek the truth as to who you are. Yeah, that was very powerful. I would make sure that goes in. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I, th I had a ton of fun through this podcast. I feel like I learned a ton while yeah. talking to you itself. I appreciate it. And thank you for uh, the work you're doing to to bring more awareness to these, these types of conversations. Yeah, thanks a ton.
Oh, 